This series we've been in called Something to Hope For, we are essentially taking a deep dive into Romans chapter number eight. Some have described Romans eight as the greatest chapter in the Bible. Now, if you had to ask me like, what's the most famous verse in the Bible, it would be a John three sixteen, right? For God so loved the world. Everybody knows that verse, but Romans eight is impactful because, and I hope you're beginning to see this as we're studying through it, it just, Paul, who wrote this, packs in so much truth, so much theology, so much church doctrine. Is that still an okay word, right? So much uh, truth about the gospel into Romans 8 that it's been described as the greatest chapter in the Bible. And that's why we're going three, four, five verses at a time, uh, just digging into what Paul wrote. And uh, notes for today are in the app. We're, we're, we're going to have lots of verses to read in Romans 8, and then I'm going to jump around a little bit to make a few other connections. But if you would join me in standing up, we're going to read together our key passage, and then we'll jump into our message. Romans 8, we're going to read verses 18 through 24. Again, notes are in the app if you'd like to follow along there or they'll be on the screens if you'd like to follow along there. Paul writes, he says, I consider, somebody say consider. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory, somebody say glory, the glory that will be revealed in us. That word glory, um, it, it literally means both in the Hebrew, which the Old Testament is written in, and in the Greek, uh, which the New Testament is written in, that word glory means weight, something weighty, something, something heavy. It's what I tell my wife. You know, I'm not, I'm not fat. I just carry a lot of glory with me. Um, but it means something weighty, right? It means something heavy. There's, uh, there, there, there's some substance to it, right? Uh, the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we eagerly await our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all for who hopes for what they already have. Let me pray for us. Lord, I pray that you would open up your word, help us to see it clearly, help us to understand it uh, in a greater way than we ever have before. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak through me, that even as I'm talking, you would be preaching different messages uh, in alignment with your word to people all over the room. Help us make the right application to our lives as individuals and our life as a church. In Jesus' name we pray. Somebody say amen. amen. Look over at somebody as you sit down and tell them, you look glorious today. You look glorious today. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That's not right. That is what it means though. So I mean, <laughs> You know what I think? You know what I think? I think kids today are spoiled. <laughs> you think that too, right? One of the ways I think kids today are spoiled is it doesn't matter what time of the day or night, if they like have a favorite TV show, they can find it and watch it. When I was a kid, if you wanted to watch kids' TV shows, you had to wait till Saturday morning. Uh, the rest of the week was not for kids. It was news and, uh, and other stuff, but Saturday morning was kids' TV. Now, if you want kids' TV, it's on phones, it's on iPads, it's on... I grew up in a time, and some of y'all are going to remember this, some of y'all will remember before this, when at a certain hour, the best thing on TV was infomercials. And so I grew up watching Ron Popeil, you know, Billy Mays, 
all these people pitching stuff, and I loved infomercials. I'd be 10, 12, 13 years old up watching infomercials. Man, I remember when you couldn't buy the George Foreman grill in Target, you had to buy that thing off the TV. And I would think, man, look at all that grease run off. Look at all that grease. George is telling me. It's a, it's a healthy way to eat a burger. I'll never forget the one purchase I made from, I obviously had to get parents' permission because I was a kid, I didn't have a credit card, uh, was, was, was a magic set. I, when I was, I, man, I always wanted to learn how to do magic whenever I was a kid. And this guy was on there doing magic. He was making stuff disappear and doing card tricks. And people were just amazed in this infomercial, you know. And so I thought, God, that's going to be me. I'm going to just walk around and amaze people. I will say 25 years later, I still don't know magic. Uh, it's been a while since, I guess my wife is amazed by me. But I, nobody else is just amazed by me. But anyway, one of the things I remember are a few lines that have become famous, right, from infomercials are, set it in, yeah, there you go, they're doing, you you could be in the audience for an infomercial, set it in, yeah, that's a famous line from infomercials, but probably the most famous line to ever come out of infomercials are, they, they'd be showing you how amazing this chopper, this slicer, this dicer, this grill, whatever it is, and you'd be like, man, this is phenomenal. This is amazing. If you watched it long enough, they would make you a believer that you needed this gadget, you needed this product. They would tell you how great of a deal it was, and, and if you just, you know, 16 payments of 999 break it down, make it real easy for everybody to buy this gadget. And then just when you were thinking, man, just to get you over the line, you're thinking, God, this is good. This could work. They would say, but wait, there's more. And that's when your head explodes. No way, you know. How could there be even more for 16 payments of (laughs) $9.99.99? But wait. There's more. And, you know, today, I want to speak to you from, from that idea. And I'm not selling you anything. I'm not pitching you anything. But I think as far as application to our life, that's a good way to live. Like Knowing that what we've experienced is not all there is. There's more. There's, a, there's a, an old quote that I like. It's a, it's a, it's a Yiddish, like, Jewish quote, but it says, to a worm in horseradish, the whole world is horseradish. And the point is, if we are consumed, like if we only know one thing, it can be really hard to believe that there's something different out there, that there's something more out there. To the worm in horseradish, right, the whole world's horseradish. One of the most difficult things we can do as, as people is, if we've been raised a certain way, to believe a certain way, is to recognize sometimes that what we've been taught, what we've known, what we've experienced is not all there is, sometimes not even the best that there is, and it takes a lot of strength, it takes a lot of faith, it takes a lot of willpower to be willing to say, I believe there's more. I believe that I don't know it all, I haven't experienced it all, uh, but that there's more for me on the other side of what I'm experiencing or what I know. And, and so today, we have, and, and Paul mentioned the word present several times in Romans 8, 18 through 24, we have the present in focus. The, the, the troubles of the present. How many of you recognize that we live in troublesome times? We live in difficult times. And and Paul here, and for today's passage, he talks about the difficulties of the present day, the difficulties of the present time. But how did we get here? Really quick, I'm going to review. We said in Romans 3.10 that there is none righteous, no, not one. That means nobody can save themselves. That means we're all uh, sinful. That means no matter how good we are, no matter how much of the Bible we know, None of us can get to heaven on our own goodness, right? There is none righteous, no, not one. 
Well, that creates a problem for us because later in Romans 6.23, Paul says the wages of that sinfulness or what that sinfulness brings is what? Death. So we're all sinful, and the result of that sinfulness or the, the, the end of that sinfulness is death. It's death here, but it's also death there. It's death on the other side of this life and death, right? It's eternal death, eternal separation from God. However, there's some good news in there. Paul says, but in juxtaposition with the wages, there's a gift, right? So the wages of sin is death, but the gift, somebody say the gift, the gift of who? God is eternal life. So I'm not righteous, I can't save myself, what I've earned is death, but God, by his grace, gives me a gift of life. In Romans 8, 1, Paul says, as the result of that, there is therefore now no condemnation. So I had a death sentence. My sin earned me death, but God gave me a gift that brings life and salvation to me. And so the result is there is therefore now no condemnation, no more death sentence for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's good news. Hey, if you're a believer, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're not condemned. You don't have a death sentence. You did, but you don't, right? You were unholy, now you're holy. You were unrighteous, now you're righteous. You were lost, now you're found. There's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Now, specifically for those who are in Christ, there is a part we play in this. We don't save ourselves, but we do surrender our lives to the one who does. And those who are in Christ, in Romans 8, 4, Paul tells us, do not live according to the flesh, but live according to the flesh to the Spirit. So he said the Holy Spirit's main goal in your life is uh, sanctification. Now that's a big kind of churchy word, it's a Bible word, but essentially what it means is that God, through his Holy Spirit, is helping you become more like Jesus. So he saves you and calls you righteous, he calls you holy, he calls you perfect, when, you're, when you surrender to him, but you and I know that we're not perfect. And so he sends his Holy Spirit to help us become more like what he calls us, but we know we're not, right? We know he calls us righteous, we know we're not. The Holy Spirit tries to help us become more righteous, more holy, more like Jesus. And he doesn't do this all at once. When you surrender your life to Jesus, you're saved all at once. But he, then he sends the Holy Spirit and he makes you righteous as you cooperate, as you walk with him, right? Little by little, progressively. And that process will take the rest of your life. So it's safe to say there's nobody in the room that has it all together. All of us have next steps to take, all of us have growth. And the Holy Spirit is still working on all of us. He's working to give us a new mind. Because you can't have a new life with an old mind, right? He's working to give us a new life because once you get a new mind, whatever your mind is set on, your life is eventually going to, you know, live out. He, he, He reminds us that we have a new obligation, not to the flesh, but to the Spirit. That we're not just following Jesus because we're great people. We're following Jesus because we're grateful people. We remember that we were lost, now we're found. We were unrighteous, now we're made righteous, right? We We have a new obligation. It's an obligation of gratitude. And that walking with the Spirit, that new mind, that new life, that new obligation, we said last week, brings us home to our new Father. Romans 8, 15, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. So Paul here, and we read this last week, but he set up a passage about 
suffering, a passage about pain. And I think these verses do several things. I think the first thing these verses do is they do away with the idea that Christianity is only and always po- positivity and, you know, happiness and weirdness. You know, it's just like Christianity is not Pleasantville. Some people think it is, but it's not. Paul acknowledges suffering. Paul acknowledges pain, and we live it, right? We know it. He says we cry, Abba. That word cry is the same word cry that the gospel writers use for when Jesus cries on the cross. It's not a sweet cry. It's a pain cry. It's a suffering cry. It's a I'm going through hell cry. And you're crying out for your father. And Paul says for believers, this, remember this is for people who are in Christ. If we suffer with him, we will one day be glorified with him. And so with suffering in focus, with pain in mind, I want to give uh, the truth about times of suffering and pain. Let's jump back over to Romans 8.18. Paul says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. Here's the first truth about times of suffering and pain is pain is a reality. Pain is something we're all going to experience. Serving Jesus is not a get out of pain free card. There are people that love Jesus, serve Jesus, and live for Jesus under immense amounts of pain, uh, under incredible suffering. And we know that. We live that. We, we've, we've all seen loved ones pass away. We've all had our heart broken. We've all been disappointed. We've all been sick. We've all had a loved one who's been sick or dealt with debilitating issues and debilitating sicknesses. We understand, especially over the last year and a half, that pain is a reality of life. And I think it's comforting that Scripture doesn't gloss over the idea of pain. Scripture doesn't tell you just pretend like you're not hurting when you are. Scripture is not just positive thinking for uh, aversion's sake, right? Scripture acknowledges the reality of suffering and the reality of pain. And Paul then begins to tell us why there is pain and why there is suffering. He says, the creation was subjected to frustration. Have you ever been frustrated? Paul says, not just us, but the entire world is is under this frustration. If you have a King James or an ESV, it says uh, futility. Futility means like, what's the point? You ever worked really hard and then what you were working for didn't work out? It's futility, it's frustration, it's disappointment, it's things don't go the way we want them to go. And the world that we live in, not just us, but the systems, the laws, the, the, the natural laws, not just the governmental laws, but the world that we live in is subject to frustration, not by its own choice. So he does make a distinction that people are subject to frustration by our own choice. We choose to sin, right? But creation is subject to frustration not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. Who's that, the devil? No, that's God. So the world is subject to frustration not because it chose frustration, but because, because God subjected it to frustration. Well, Lord, why in the world would he do that? Well, he did that at the very beginning of time whenever Adam and Eve sinned. It all goes back to people making choices. Do you want to know why there's pain in the world? Because people make choices. 
And we live in a broken, frustrating, sometimes futile world because Adam and Eve sinned, and as a result, God brought a curse upon, or their sin uh, brought a curse. God pronounced a curse on humanity and on the world itself. So why is there pain? Why is there struggling? Because we live in a broken world, broken by sin, broken by the choices that people make. But, but I love the last two words, and they kind of set us up for the next verse, but he subjected it to frustration in hope. He, he didn't subject it to frustration, and then that's it. Sin brought a curse. God pronounced a curse, but he pronounced the curse in hope. something else would become reality. So here's a big question. And this is a question people stumble over when they consider our faith. If God is so good, why is there so much suffering in the world? Why is there so much pain in the world? It's a tough one, yeah? Because we say we, we, we worship a good God, an all-knowing God, an all-powerful God. God who can do anything. Well, then why do we hurt? Why do people hurt people? The atheist would say, it's because there is no God. We're just in a chaotic realm that accidentally got here, and, you know, the nature of nature is chaos. Others would say, well, it's because God is not all-powerful or God is not all good, or God is not all knowing. Uh, some would even say, well, there's, no, there's really no such thing as evil. It's just our perception of evil. And, and you can take a number of paths to try to answer that question. I do think it's a question that we have to, whether or not we answer it well, we have to come to terms with. And we have to be okay with our answer. Well, the Christian answer, and, and I hope this isn't a letdown, it's going to require some faith, but you have faith, right? We're people of faith. Here's the Christian answer. If God is good, why is there so much pain in the world? And, and, and the answer is this. God's not done yet. He's not done yet. He subjected it to frustration because of the choices people make, but he subjected it in hope. That it's not frustration forever, it's not futility forever, it's, it's not broken forever, it's not fallen forever, it's broken now, it's fallen now, it's frustrating now, but it's not that way forever. And so the Christian answer to pain is God's not done and so we walk by faith. Not by sight, man, that's sad, that's horrific, my heart breaks, but I know that the good God, the loving God, the all-knowing God, the omnipotent God is worth doing something in and through the pain that's going to turn it around. So yes, pain is a reality. The Bible never pretends pain is not real, but here's what the Bible tells us, number two, pain is not forever. Pain is our reality in the present, but it won't be our reality always in the future. Romans 8, 21 says, he, it says, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and the glory of the children of God. So let's, let's, let's take it piece by piece. Bondage to decay. Bondage to uh, disorder, bondage to, you know what this is? If you remember this from like high school science class, it's the second law of thermodynamics. It's the law of entropy, the law of disorder. What this tells us, and science, scientists have discovered this, but you know, this was in scripture a long time before they discovered it, is everything left to itself gets worse. If you need a good example, think about your house right now. If you don't, if you just leave it alone, you just throw your hands up and say, I'm not picking up another sock, I'm not wiping another counter, how long does it take before your house gets gross? About 
you know, half a day. It's, 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 it's bondage to decay. It's just the way of the broken world we live in that if anything is left to itself, it doesn't automatically get better. It automatically gets worse. We know that. If we don't exercise, what happens to our bodies, right? You don't clean your car, what happens to the inside of your car? So Paul says the world is in bondage to decay. It's, it's trending toward disorder. That's why he's like, man, it seems like it's worse than ever before. It's trending towards worse, not better. But it won't trend that way forever because one day, according to what we just read, uh, the creation itself will be liberated from that disorder and brought into freedom. So one day, this is the promise of Scripture, God is going to step into the mess. He's going to step into the disorder and say, that's enough. That's all. No more in the wrong direction. I'm cleaning everything up. I'm making everything right. That day is coming. That day is in our future. It's like your house. It gets worse until you say, okay, I'm not going to live this way. And then you step in and make it better. Well, one day God is going to step into the bondage of decay and he's going to bring freedom and glory to the brokenness and the fallenness in our world. And so, yes, pain is real, but God's not done. Okay, Chase, well then why doesn't he just go ahead and step in? The house is a mess. It's because number three, pain has a purpose. God has a purpose in our pain. Jump back to Romans eight seventeen. Paul said, if indeed, talking about believers, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. We all want the glory. But we don't want the suffering, right? But pain is the path to the glory. Suffering is the way to God. I know that's not exciting, right? We're supposed to be talking about hope. I'll get there. But if you love Jesus and you're going to heaven, you're going to have to fight a lot of hell to get there. And I know everybody else's life looks easy. It's not. Somebody, I was out of town this week at a conference. Somebody was asking uh, about Pastor Steve. I was like, you know, how's he doing? So I was just kind of telling a little bit about how he's doing. I was like, oh, man, that's, you know, that's tough. And my response was, and it's a genuine response at this point, is everybody's got something, man. And it's the truth. We tend to get hyper-focused on our thing, right? The, the, the disappointment, the frustration, the futility, the sickness, whatever it may be. And we forget that everybody's got something. because we live in that broken world. But pain has a purpose. It's the path to glory. It's the path back to God. And so Paul writes in Romans 8, 22, we know that the whole creation, not just us, but the entire earth, has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right back to the present time. Now, my wife told me not to mention the fact that she's pregnant, so I'm not going to mention that. But when she was pregnant last time, can I talk about the last time? I didn't learn as much about childbirth as she did, but I learned a little bit. Contractions get you ready for the new birth. He said the earth is groaning. The earth is in pain. The earth is feeling the contractions of something new that's on the way. 
We're talking about the pain having a purpose. The pain gets you ready for what's next. Man, if you're too comfortable in the now, you're not even looking for what's next. When a lady is getting ready to have birth, those contractions serve a purpose. Number one, they literally get her body ready for the baby in a physiological way, but then secondarily, in a psychological way, she's ready for whatever to get this baby here. Right? Say, I'll go through hell, I'll jump fence, I'll do whatever you want me to do if I can see the new birth. And that's the purpose in the pain of now. It's to help us take our mind off of the present. See, what happens is the pain makes us hyper-focus on the present. It's not supposed to make us hyper-focus on the present. The pain is supposed to make us focus on the new thing that's coming, the new thing that's ahead. Paul says that he subjected it to frustration in hope that one day the pain was going to give new birth to something, to glory, right, to freedom. And so what I'm saying is, you know, when you feel the pain, look forward, don't look down. It's getting you ready. It's helping your spirit say, God, whatever you want. It's helping your spirit say, I don't know everything. It's helping humble you. It's helping make you grateful for God's help. It's helping keeping you dependent. The pain has a purpose. Why is there pain? Man, in some way God is using it to get us ready For what's next? The world trends towards disorder. We trend toward disorder. The only way to trend toward order and progress is pain, is to discipline yourself, to, Paul says, buffet your body, to to interrupt what you'd rather do and do something you don't want to do so that you can be better, right? Eat the salad instead of the chicken fried steak. What I'm saying is pain brings us someplace that comfort doesn't allow us to go. So in some ways, pain is a gift. I'm not saying that sickness is a gift, but the pain, the pain can help you if you let it. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. So pain gets us ready for the new, for, for the new birth. What's the new birth? Well, it's the last two, verse, two chapters of Isaiah. It's a new heavens. It's a new earth. It's a new us. It's Revelation chapter 21, right? That one day, everything we know is going to change. The world won't be horseradish anymore, right? My wife and I are very slowly watching the Lord of the Rings movies because when they came out, I tried to do midnight showings with Pastor Matt and I fell asleep three times out of three. Those are long movies. I mean, they're three hours long and that's the shortcut. So we're like watching 45 minutes at a time. But I remember reading the books and one of my favorite lines from those books is, And one of the characters, they thought he was dead, he comes back. And when he sees, or when one of the other characters sees him, he says, just amazed that he's not dead. What he thought was true is not true. He says, well, everything sad become untrue. And the writer of those books was a believer, and what he had in mind in writing that line was the fact that Everything sad in a broken world will become untrue when God's glory is revealed. Everything that breaks your heart now, everything that frustrates you now, everything that has you questioning your faith, questioning yourself, questioning your past, present, and future, one day everything sad will become untrue. And one theologian said, and somehow it will become better because it was once lost and broken. There is purpose in the pain. 
It's bringing a new birth. It's getting you ready for the new heavens, the new earth, the new you. And so what does that mean? What does that mean for us? It means that pain can't kill our hope. Can't kill our hope unless we let it. So pain is real. But pain won't last forever. Pain does has a, have a purpose. But pain can't kill your hope. Verse 23, not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly. Remember, the pain makes you eager for what's next. We groan as we wait, as we eagerly wait for our adoption to sonship. What is that? The redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. For who hopes what they already, for what they already have? Now, and I'm bringing this thing to an end, but I, I think I would do you a disservice if I didn't mention this. In Scripture, when it comes to our salvation, there's a concept. It's an already not yet concept. And you see this in Scripture a lot. And here's an example. We're already saved but we're not yet saved. We're already, we read this last week, we're already adopted into the family of God. But Paul here, just a few verses later, says we're still awaiting our adoption into the family of God. There's this already, not yet. We're, called, we're already righteous, but we know better, right? We know that we're not yet righteous. So there's this already, not yet thing that happens in Scripture. And what Paul is saying is that when you become a believer, you're adopted into the family of God, but we know we're still living in a broken world. We're called righteous, but we know we're not righteous. And so the already gives us hope in the not yet that one day I'm gonna come into the full understanding of what it means to be in God's family. Because right now it's limited. Like I'm in the family of God, but man, I'm still subject to this world. And Paul says what has happened is God, knowing that, knowing that, man, this may be hard to understand, may be hard to believe, he sends his spirit. And what his spirit is, is a little bit of the not yet that breaks into the right now. He says the spirit is a deposit of the other side. It's a deposit of the glory in our future. He gives us the Holy Spirit so that we know in the not yet that there's more in our future. So he says, in this hope we're saved. That one day we are going to be fully redeemed, not just our spirit, but our bodies and our minds and our souls as well. And the Holy Spirit reminds us of this and helps us walk towards this and helps believe this and comforts us in our pain that one day we're going to be totally and completely redeemed. Right now I'm saved, but I'm not, I'm still subject. One day I'll be saved and I'll be subject to nothing but God. No sin will overpower me. No evil will overtake me. No, no, no pain will you know, have its way with me. So in the midst of the brokenness, in the midst of the pain, what Paul says is we have hope. Pain can't kill your hope. And hope here is not a wish. It's not like I hope so. It's an expectation. It's absolute confidence. People that have the Holy Spirit in the midst of their pain, they have a little bit of what is to come on the inside of them, and the, 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 the result is it makes them absolutely confident that there is more than what I'm experiencing, that this life is not all there is, that there's more on the other side of this pain. In the midst of the brokenness, there's more, there's better, there's glory, there's rebirth, there is hope. Ahead of me. 
man, what a future you have. 1 Corinthians 2.9, Paul says, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind could conceive, these are the things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things God reveals to us by his spirit. <coughs> Excuse me. So what's the Bible's answer to pain? What's our response to the pain? We go back to the first verse we read today, Romans 8, 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. Paul says the suffering is real. The pain is real. But I consider something else. If we only consider the pain, the pain will overwhelm. So we consider something else. What's our response? We consider the glory in our future, not just the pain in our present. What does that word glory mean? Wait. And let me just tell you, the glory in your future far outweighs the pain in the present. You feel the pain of the present right now because you're subject to the right now. But what's coming is far greater, far better, much more significant. This week when your heart breaks, consider the glory in your future. Next time somebody lets you down, consider the glory ahead of you. Don't let the pain make you only think about the pain and the loss. You got to look up. You got to look forward. It's what Jesus did. Hebrews 12, 2, the writer says, we do this, how? By keeping our eyes on Jesus. The champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Watch this, watch this, watch this. Because the joy awaiting him, the joy in his future, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. And now he's seated at the right hand of God in the place of honor. So Jesus endured the very present pain of the cross by focusing his eyes on something in his future. You know what he was thinking about? You know what he was focusing on? Us. He knew that this pain has a purpose, that my death is going to make salvation possible for people who are condemned. And in the midst of the pain, it brought joy. It brought hope. And he endured the pain thinking about the present. We do the same. We consider, like Paul said, we put our eyes on the glory ahead of us. And we endure the pain of the present. Watch this. Jesus endured the cross by putting his eyes on us. We endure our present pain by putting our eyes on him. Put your eyes on Jesus. You can live through anything. You can make it through anything. It's not going to kill you. It's not going to take you out. Put your eyes on Jesus. Consider the glory, not just the pain. 